In the pilot episode of the FX series Reservation Dogs, we meet a character who seems familiar, like we've seen him a hundred times before. Oh, young warrior. Looks as though you've tasted the white man's lead. Most people expect a super stoic Native American on horseback with feathers. That's Dallas Goldtooth. I mean, I do show up on horseback in feathers. Are you crazy horse or sitting? No, no, no. I'm not one of those awesome guys. No, I'm more of your, uh, I'm more of your unknown warrior. Beyond that, all expectations are upended. Officially, his name is William Knife Man, but most people know him as Spirit. I was at the Battle of Little Bighorn. That's right. I didn't kill anybody. But I fought bravely. Well, I didn't actually fight. I actually didn't even get into the fight itself. But I came over that hill real rugged like, ah, ah. I saw a custer like that. That yellow hair. He's a spirit helper that curses and has no qualms about dropping penis jokes in the middle of delivering wise sage wisdom. What are you going to do? What are you going to fight for? Ah! Nah, I just have no idea. But for real though. Listen to what I said. Marinate on that. Oh. Let's go. Ha. You're listening to It's Been a Minute from NPR. I'm Tracy Hunt. Today's guest is the actor, writer, and organizer, Dallas Goldtooth. He, of course, plays Spirit on Reservation Dogs. Its second season is airing on FX and Hulu. He's also a writer on the show. Dallas goes way back with the show's creator, Sterling Harjo. They were both part of the Native American sketch comedy group, the 1491s. That humor is in the DNA of Reservation Dogs. But acting and comedy are only part of it. Dallas has long been an organizer for climate justice and indigenous rights. And he's been a key collaborator in movements against major oil pipelines on native lands. I talked to Dallas about merging his passions, bringing comedy to activism, and vice versa. But first, I wanted to know more about his character on Reservation Dogs and how he turns Native American tropes on their head. We are forced to confront, as Native storytellers, this like long history, this lineage mm-hmm. of how Native people have been portrayed yeah. in media, right? right? And you asked most common Americans, regular old person living in Iowa, what does a Native American person look like? Mm-hmm. Typically, they'll draw a picture of somebody on horseback with feathers and living in a teepee, right. not necessarily somebody wearing Nikes and <laughs> going to, you know, McDonald's. Right. And so Reservation Dogs is trying to tell its own story, but at the same time, we're also trying to confront and dismantle those portrayals. And spirit is basically how we do that directly. Yeah. Um, what kind of feedback has you, have you gotten from viewers, family, friends? People love Spirit. I, I did <laughs> not. I mean, I had a blast portraying this character, but I did not really expect how much joy people would find out mm-hmm. of this character. I, and I think the reason for it is that we're, we're poking fun at how non-natives see us. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, spirit is poking fun at ourselves of how we portray ourselves sometimes as Native people. I'm not going to be here forever, so... The moment we're born, we're going to die. No, I mean California. California! Oh! Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's where you're going to go. You're going to run away, head off west, dreaming big. We take ourselves way too serious at times, right? And there's always that uncle who always wants to be the most Indian of Indians, right? The the (laughs) one that has to be the supreme native uncle. Mm -hmm. I think that like the type of comedy I like to do is, is really a a type of comedy where nothing really is sacred. Mm -hmm. That humor is a vehicle for us to offer social critique, but not only about the world, but also how we interact with the world. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, so do you ever worry about like how non-natives will interpret a character like Spirit, like that they will see the stereotype and think that the stereotype is true or like anything like that? Well, I guess what I, one unique aspect of this is what I really enjoy is that depending on who you are, mm-hmm. you find joy in different ways because I've, I've talked to folks who are like, uh, Latino and black and, fo- and they're like, do we like it because you're making fun of how white people think about brown folks like that's the joy we find out of it is that we're you're pushing back against 
whiteness and, and its perceptions of how brown folks should be and specifically how indigenous people should be. And there's like a joy in that, right? Of challenging yeah. white supremacy and it's and, and how it shows up in that way. And then also like our own folks, it's challenging how we see ourselves. And so, uh, yeah, I, I really, I think that folks get it. Yeah. You know, I was watching Reservation Dogs and at some point I was like, wow, is every Native American actor in this show right now? <laughs> And I mean, obviously they're not, but it was like a parade of, oh, I know that guy. Oh, who, that that's that guy in that thing, like all of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for someone who's non-Native like me, it was kind of like, oh, wow, the depth of Native talent out there is so deep and so vast. And we could be doing so much more for telling Native stories. What has that been like working with this mostly Native cast? You know, this is my first major, like, production mm -hmm. right before yeah. this we were just making youtube videos mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so I, I i've been fortunate right i have a privilege of coming into this space into the first tv production where the majority of the cast is native mm -hmm. the all the writers are native all the directors are native mm -hmm. on the actual crew there's native folks who are like the camera operators and the people dressing the, the set like I've been very, very fortunate and I've had conversations with other actors uh, like Gary Farmer and Wes Studi who have been doing this for like 30, 40 years. Yeah. Who just put in the work mm -hmm. in not so friendly circumstances and, yeah. and environments. So I think all of us as all the, the writers in the room, we'd actually sit there and say, all right, oh man, how can we pull in these like juggernauts how can we write a part for so-and-so? How can we actually get somebody into this show and create a space for them? So like it was very much intentional to acknowledge our elders. Yeah, yeah. You know, there are more opportunities. We're seeing these big projects like Echo, Prey, Dark Winds. As someone who spent years developing characters with your comedy troupe, the 1491s, and, and Sterling Harjo was in the 1491s too, right? Um, yeah. Is there like a story or a character out there that you'd really like to put on the screen? Ooh, good question. <laughs> um, you know what I would love to see is a parody farce story about like the greatest chiefs of all time, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like a Monty Python, Mel Brooks kind of uh, spectac spectac uh, spectacular. <laughs> um, <laughs> Of, uh, all extravaganza. The greatest, a, <laughs> extravaganza. There you go. It's like a Bell Brooks, Monty Python extravaganza of like all the great Indian stories, but retold mm -hmm. with our own type of humor. Like a lot of these stories are the bedrock of the American myth mm -hmm. and this idea of, you know, a westward expansion and manifest destiny and this mm -hmm. romanticization of who we are as Native people. Yeah. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity to challenge those myths, but mm -hmm. also to honor the realities of our shared experience as Native peoples on this land in a lot of the struggle that we've been through. Mm -hmm. But I would love to tackle something like that. Coming up, where comedy and activism come together. You know, outside of acting, you've been heavily involved in activism basically your whole life. Your father is well-known activist Tom Goldtooth, who founded the Indigenous Environmental Network, um, and you've also worked with IEN. For some people, like activists and comedian are very different, but I kind of get the sense that they overlap naturally for you. Does that feel true? It's, to be honest, it's something I've I've struggled with, right? Mm. Um I think first and foremost, I self-identify as an organizer mm -hmm. of which I have, I've been an activist in certain circumstances, but mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. an activist is somebody that you can depend on to show up. Mm -hmm. An organizer is somebody that, that invests their time and labor mm -hmm. to create change and create the situation for mm -hmm. community to build power. Mm -hmm. Right. I firmly believe this world needs more organizers rather than activists mm -hmm. and nothing against activism and activists. But I think that what I am committed to is seeing tribal nations assert their self-determination and sovereignty 
And as somebody that's dedicated to see other communities be liberated Mm -hmm. uh, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, I try to bring that into all aspects of my work, labor and in art. Mm -hmm. And so I do see a connection in my comedy as one way for us to challenge our perceptions of the world around us Mm -hmm. and to provide opportunity for us to imagine a world in which we are free to be as we want to be Mm -hmm. and to, and we are free to radically imagine a future in which we find joy. Yeah. When you're talking earlier about like bringing joy into activism, I was reminded of this um, Emma Golden quote. She was a political activist in like the 19, early 1900s um, in America. And she has this quote where she says, if I can't dance, I don't want to be in your revolution. <laughs> um, yes. Why do you think um, activists feel the need to be perceived as, as so serious? You, you managed to bring a lot of joy into it. Like you joked on MSNBC about charging tourists $10 to take photos with a real live Native American yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. I got a couple tourists taking pictures of me, you know, and I, I charge them $10, you know. <laughs> I got to get something out of it, you know. Dang, I, I say uh, some yeah, silly, yeah, some yeah, stupid yeah, stuff yeah, sometimes. You, you, sometimes, and it's great, <laughs> and it's great, and it makes people laugh, so it's perfect. Uh, but why do you think activists want to be so perceived as being serious? Well, well, I don't think an activist want to be, and I don't want to, like, yeah. I don't want to take away from mm-hmm. folks' righteous anger, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. sometimes rage is justified. Mm-hmm. Anger is justified. Because we are dealing with a system that is predicated upon the oppression of many mm-hmm. for the benefit of a few. Right. And so I don't want to take that away. Mm-hmm. But I also see that what colonization does to us, mm-hmm. how it actually affects us in the body, it takes away our ability to use our complete self to respond to the world around us. Right. Yeah. Right. And I feel like the ability to laugh, Mm -hmm. like, right, the the freedom to laugh Mm -hmm. is one of the first things that gets cut. Yeah. It's one of the the first things that the colonizing mentality takes from us is the ability to not only feel joy, Mm -hmm. but to express joy. Yeah. And so as such, I feel like it's essential for us to bring joy into the work that we are doing, Mm -hmm. to allow ourselves to feel it and to express joy and for a lot of folks, it's hard to do because mm-hmm. like we have a perceived identity that in order to be an activist, in order to be an organizer, you have to be angry all the time. Yeah. And I feel like that in of itself is a causation of colonization, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Like anger is a natural part of our emotions, but like we have to allow ourselves to access other parts of our emotional spectrum. Yeah. You know, this feels very related to your characters on scene, on screen. Sorry, you are trying to push against all this stoic and mystical imagery of the Native American. You know, there's a scene in the second season that you co-wrote where two older guys are near a stream trying to break a curse. Creator, I pray you take pity upon these kids. They did something they ain't proud of. But the whole time they're actually arguing about sleeping with the same woman. <laughs> you should not sleep with your buddy's old lady while they're broke up because there's a good chance they will get back together again like we did. My dog, my dog. You know, it's not that holy, but, you know, you're there as, as spirit. Oh, old warrior. Ah! You tell them, you tell them a little b- there that this most sacredest of ceremonies is complete. So you poke fun at the serious work of organizing and the stereotypical seriousness of ritual. What else do you think is too serious? That's a great way you phrase it. I like that. The seriousness of ritual, right? Mm-hmm. That's a great phrase. I'm taking that. I'm taking that. I'm going <laughs> to use fine, that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to give a little backstory. That actual scene mm-hmm. is straight from a sketch that the 1491s that we used to do for years. We yeah. did a, it's 1491s are all native comedy troupe. All of us are in the writer's room. Sterling Harjo is one of the members. And uh, we had this sketch that it's a bunch of native men in a sweat lodge, which is a ceremony. And in the sketch, that exchange happens where there's two men who one guy's ex is now dating the other one and they <laughs> passively aggressively offer prayers 
and they uh, they don't want to talk to each other, so they talk to the creator instead, and and they have a, an argument. Mm-hmm. And um, we felt it was like this is a perfect moment to bring that sketch into the show, and um, its purpose exactly what you said it was to challenge like the seriousness of ritual and to like poke fun at ourselves as native men when we take <laughs> ourselves way too serious and i you actually could take away the word native sometimes as men how we take ourselves way, too, way serious too serious at times yeah and our own dysfunction as men our our toxicity as men sometimes is so damn hilarious <laughs> like you so we are so dysfunctional it is like we step back you're like do you see what you guys are doing like do you see how you are behaving like mm-hmm. you're just children that's all you are and so that's kind of the the inspiration for that that scene coming up what his father a legendary organizer thinks of his acting you know pulling back after all this direct action with clear impact, like stopping the Keystone XL pipeline. I wonder how you're feeling about the impact of your acting work. Uh, you know, what kind of impact are you looking for in your work? Oh, I, I don't know. That's a, I've been really struggling with this lately because mm-hmm. the acting work, I'm, I've been getting more acting jobs and then I'm trying to get into writing yeah. And a part of me is trying to justify it, right? Like, okay, I can, I'm making a change. I'm making a difference in doing this world work. Mm-hmm. But I also, I still have that perception that activism has to be done in a certain way, right? Mm-hmm. I have this perception that change can only come from a certain route. Right. And I see the acting work and the TV work as like almost lesser than, and I'm trying to deal with that. I guess the part of me that does justify the work that I'm doing now with storytelling Mm -hmm. comes from the the core understanding that really you cannot have a successful social movement. You cannot Mm -hmm. have a a successful civil rights movement. You can't have a a successful outcome without a story-based strategy. Mm. Like, it's stories that move us. It is stories that provide hope. Mm -hmm. for change every aspect of our society every aspect of of our economy and the world we live in is based on stories it's Mm -hmm. fabrications what's money yeah (laughs) money is fabricated we put power into it right right and right now the story that we live in the story of extraction Mm -hmm. and capitalism and colonization is the bedrock of our country and of the world economy. And what we're trying to offer is an alternative to that story. Indigenous peoples, black, brown, poor white folks, we've been working tirelessly to challenge that story. And Mm -hmm. I feel like my part in like making fun of it and making fun of how we, how we see ourselves Mm -hmm. is, is just a little bit of dismantling that. Yeah. Can you talk about a memorable story that you used in organizing? Back in the middle of the Keystone XL pipeline fight, which mm-hmm. was a, ma- uh, a fight against a tar sands pipeline that was going to pass through traditional Lakota, Dakota territories, um, mm-hmm. through so-called South Dakota. We brought both native and non-native landowners, frontline folks, to Washington, D.C. We set up a bunch of teepees on the National Mall. Mm-hmm. It was pretty awesome. During that time, we brought horseback riders. Mm-hmm. We had over 35 or so horseback riders into Washington, D.C. on horseback, native and Mm non-native, brought them to the doorstep of then-President Barack Obama, Mm -hmm. his house. And we had the most diehard Republican ranchers of western Nebraska sitting down with with native folks who predominantly vote Democrat, who are like more, obviously, very, very progressive, Mm -hmm. and, and find commonality and find common ground in the protection of water Mm -hmm. and it was that that struggle to protect the sacredness of water that really brought them together Mm -hmm. and i see that as a pivotal moment where we really built collective power and and flexed our muscle Mm -hmm. and uh, you know a year later president uh, obama canceled or rejected the Mm -hmm. permit for that pipeline and we we won yeah. I'm curious. Your dad is like this legendary organizer. What does he think of your acting? My dad supports 
my my acting and my artistic expression to the fullest. Well, let me start over. My brother, Miggy Z Pensino, he's one of the producers of Reservation Dogs. Mm -hmm. He's my stepbrother. We grew up with each other. Mm -hmm. And we always wanted to tell stories. Mm -hmm. And we would film like backyard movies in my dad's shed. And 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 the entire purpose was just to make my dad and my family and our our our, our aunties and uncles laugh. That was mm-hmm. that's what our goal was. Yeah. And I'm I'm so lucky that we've gone from videos in my dad's shed to being on Hulu and like making stories on like with the m- millions of dollars of production value behind it. Yeah. My dad sees the power of story understands the power of the arts and really supports me. And I, I am so grateful for that support Mm -hmm. um, and really appreciate the way he allows me to be an organizer, but then also take the time to create and and create story. And so I, I, I'm so grateful for him. Yeah. So what's your plan, you know, going forward, you know, looking at Twitter, there's hype for the shows you work on, but also um, frustration with newly Plan pipelines. Um, are you going to continue to do the the activism and the art? But like, how are you feeling going into the future? <laughs> oh, that is the question of the moment. Mm-hmm. You're tapping into my my dilemmas right now. Thank you. <laughs> um, I want to try to do my best to keep my feet planted in both, mm-hmm. right? But also be very mindful of my limitations mm-hmm. because of of like the acting stuff and the writing work that I've had to step back farther from the activism and organizing work. And other mm-hmm. folks have had to pick up the the work that I had to drop. Yeah. But at the same time, I am still a part of the movement to create systemic change mm-hmm. by telling stories that challenge the way the world is, but also to offer opportunities for us to envision a better future. Yeah. And I will always be committed to supporting grassroots frontline communities so uh, that's that's the best i can do thanks again to actor organizer and activist dallas goldtooth he stars in and writes for the series reservation dogs which is now in its second season on fx this episode of it's been a minute was produced by andrea gutierrez it was edited by Jessica Placek with support from Jessica Mendoza. Engineering support came from Quasi Lee. And our executive producer is Verilyn Williams. Listeners, we'd love to hear from you. Follow us on Twitter at NPR It's Been a Min. That's M-I-N. And you can also email us at ibam at npr.org. That's I-B-A-M at npr.org. All right, we're back on Friday. Take care, everyone. I'm Tracy Hunt. Talk soon.